up guys, Otterpop here, and welcome to another Dan vs. Review. This is going to be, be the review for Season 1, Episode 8, Dan vs. Ye Old Shakespeare Dinner Theater. Wow, that's a long title. As usual, the link to the actual reaction is going to be down in the description below, but here is just a quick recap of the episode before we get onto the review. So, after watching a bad theater show of, well, a bad theater Shakespeare show, with some bad acting and bad food, Dan tries to ruin the show by somehow getting rid of all the actors. I felt like for this particular episode, I was really hyper-focused on Dan's personality. The biggest reason being well, the inciting factor, before the title card had even appeared on screen, was the fact that Dan actually likes Shakespearean theater and has some taste, I guess, but he also has a significant amount of knowledge on the subject as well. It was a complete surprise to me. I wasn't expecting that Dan, a char well, a character like Dan, would be liking something like Shakespearean theater. Really. That I wasn't expecting that. But apparently Dan is a little bit of a poet too when he basically recites a poem to Chris on the spot explaining how he's gonna get rid of all the actors. It was, it was actually pretty good too. He had plenty of good vocabulary and it was it was a good rhyme scheme as well so i'll definitely give him credit for that i mean it i guess it shows that despite his strange lack of intelligence sometimes he can be a little clever and can be good with his words sometimes and of course in addition to him knowing a little bit about you know being clever with words and clever wordplay that's basically the same thing he also knows that the weapon that is typically used on stage, or at least for Shakespearean theater, from what I understand, is not called a fencing foil, but an epee. E P E E. I'll be honest, I had never heard of that. And I'm a writer. I know a lot of words. I have never heard that word before. How does Dan know this stuff? How, how does Dan know anything? And apparently, Dan can also fence as well, a little bit. I mean, I don't know if he's super proficient, but he's at least decently proficient to hold his own against a well-seasoned actor for a short period of time, like... And maybe just a little bit of a big thing, but Dan is capable of saying thank you. I mean, he's he's like, thank you, or to, to Elise after she helped him, you know, gather up a bunch of plans for the dinner theater so he could take enact his revenge and he but he still said thank you to Elise, so I guess he's capable of saying thank you. So <laughs> nice. But I don't know. I'd have to say my favorite part of um his little personality surprises was at the very end of the episode when he when after his little um fencing duel with the seasoned actor he's trying to get revenge against and he is just like the actor's job is to communicate material to the audience. How can you do that when you don't even know what the lines mean? And I was just like, yes, yes, thank you, yes. That is, that that is that is the best line I have heard from Dan so far. It makes it makes me smile so much thinking about it. Like, Dan said that. Dan said that of all characters. I don't know why it makes me so happy. I love that line. I love that line so hard. And the only reason I love it so much is because Dan of all people said it. Okay. I suppose for the majority of this episode, there was a little little bit more of a focus on, you know, uh, Dan and his revenge scheme and maybe a little bit of his characterization, at least in the way that I saw it. But that also doesn't mean that, you know, uh, Chris and Elise didn't get a little bit of screen time and a little bit of, uh... A development or characterization as it were like even with uh, their relationship like when Chris ends up getting injured by one of the guys with the fencing foil it makes a pretty significant mark on his face I feel kind of bad for him by the way but Elise shows a lot of protectiveness over him and <laughs> does some things to the guy who ended up hurting Chris and you know gets Dan his revenge plans or, or the the building plans so that Dan can enact his revenge scheme. So, but it, it was interesting and kind of nice to see that Elise was really protective of him in a way that I hadn't fully seen before. Like I knew that she cared for him in the past, but it seemed like she was just really protective over him. Like as soon as she saw that some somebody had hurt her baby, her baby, <laughs> she was just like, okay, who do I need to kill now? 
I mean, the whole, you know, at least being a secret government agent, whatever, and apparently having a variety of outfits for her espionage missions is a little bit weird in the relationship, especially with, you know, how she deals with the guy who hurt Chris. The relationship also seems a little bit normal, too. They still have date nights. I mean, the first date they ever had was when Chris brought Elise to said ye old Shakespeare dinner theater, and they still have, you know, date nights, and because, you know, the especially the place, even though there's bad acting and bad food, has some sentimental value to them. So the relationship is still normal in some aspects. Dan doesn't seem to get that. He doesn't seem to get the fact that, you know, married couples can still have date nights. I mean, Chris says as much, and frankly, even I said as much during the reaction. I was like, D you kidding? My parents have all kinds of date nights, whether it's anniversary related or not, because they can, because they are adults, they are married. Who cares if they are married? They can have date nights. What do you, what do you know, Dan? And as a little bit of a side note, it was a little bit funny to see, um, you know, because I, I thought Elise was a little bit more of the reasonable one, it, and it's not hard to see why, but towards the end of the episode, she's actually kind of rooting for Dan and, you know, trying to help him with his revenge scheme, which doesn't seem like the thing she'd normally do, but it doesn't relate to her governmental work, and she doesn't have a specific grudge. I mean, this this isn't freaking New Mexico, and it's not the ninja, but, you know, she just still wants to find out what Dan is up to for curiosity's sake, and she's even willing to help him. Like, it seemed like a little bit of a turn that I wasn't expecting for her character, at, at least in terms of her rela her relationship with Dan. Overall, less characterization in this particular episode, but a hecking lot of parodies, jokes, and references, especially theater-related, especially Shakespeare-related. Shocker. It, it, it's called Ye Old Shakespeare Dinner Theater. Of course there would be Shakespeare references. How could you name an episode like that and not have the Shakespearean references? I mean, to be fair, the only non-Shakespearean reference that I noticed was when Dan was putting on his disguise, a mask and a cape. It, it was kind of reminiscent of the antagonist of Phantom of the Opera. I mean, but that was that, that was the only major, like, non-Shakespearean reference. But it, it was still a theater reference nonetheless. But holy hecking Shakespeare references, and I recognized a lot. I'm sure that there's probably a couple that I missed, but I know for a fact that I recognized a lot. Like one of the chefs who was chanting, Double, double, toil and trouble, which is something from Macbeth, which I haven't read, but I do know of. Or I at least I'll know a little bit about the chant. It, it, it's, it's not a difficult chant to forget. Um, when Dan was pouring soda into one of the actor's ears, who apparently had an ear problem and he couldn't get his ears wet, uh, Dan pours some soda in there to kind of KO the actor, is a reference to um, the character Hamlet from the play Hamlet um, going to pour poison into his uncle's ear as a sort of revenge plan, which, and Hamlet is actually one that I've read, so that reference was uh, pretty obvious to me. But even the mule head that Dan finds and decides to glue it onto another actor's, like actually glue it onto another actor's head with some potential implication of there not being any way for the guy to breathe, but I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into that. I think I think my reaction covered it when I was questioning it multiple times, but uh, having the mule head on there, which is the reference to the character with the donkey head or donkey costume from Midsummer Night's Dream. I haven't read it in a while, and by the way, I have read Midsummer Night's Dream, and I have also seen it on stage. Legitimately on stage. It was, it was... Oh, such a good play, but I already talked a little bit too much about that in my reaction, so I'm gonna try not to gush over that too much. But yeah, it is one that I have I have read and I've also seen. And then, of course, uh, the obvious one, when the actor says, all the world's a stage near, was it the middle or the end of the episode? But it doesn't matter because it's a line from uh, Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, which I haven't read before, but I've heard of. And I mean, come on, all the world's a stage. You guys know the line. It's one of- it's probably one of the most infamous lines of any of Shakespeare's plays. Sure, there are plenty of other uh, infamous lines as well, but that's definitely one of the more well-known ones. But even- I think when the actor says, all the world's a stage, I think Dan and I both knew that the actor probably didn't fully know what he was even talking about. He- uh, it more seemed like he was just reciting something rather than fully understanding it, or maybe he partially understood it, but I really don't think he fully understood that, and I think Dan could see that as well. And I don't know if this is a joke or a reference or a parody or whatever, but even the actors outside of the play were talking in Old English, 
again, when they weren't acting, it's like, I don't know why, but that per particular aspect of those characters really bugged me. It really solidified my hate for them. I don't like when people do that, and there's really no reason for it. I just simply don't like when people do that. It's like, yes, you can have your passions and all that, but don't take it too far. Especially this far, just, just, just please don't. But then there were plenty of little miscellaneous things that happened throughout the entirety of the episode. For one thing, Chris and Elise actually had a little bit of a date night at a Ninja Dave's cookie shop, which I didn't even realize would be a recurring location, but apparently it is. And But it was really interesting to see because it made me think, are we going to see Ninja Dave again? Because he would be a cool recurring character to see in, um, like, you know, an episode as, you know, even a brief ally of, like, Dan, or, or maybe even some kind of weird enemy in some way, shape, or form, but knowing that that location, even, was a recurring place, I don't know, maybe the character could come back for a future episode? That, that, that'd be pretty cool to see. He, he is still technically a ninja. He's Ninja Date, for crying out loud. So he could have some useful skills to bring to the table. I mean, granted, Elise technically is also a ninja, and she beat him, but it'd be nice to have more allies on Dan's side, because, you know, he's not the character who would you would think would have any allies at all. He barely has them in Chris and Elise. <laughs> Honestly, this episode did mark a big point, at least for me specifically, because this was the first time in any of the Dan vs. episodes that I was fully on board with Dan taking revenge. Like, there are other instances where I was like, no, you really don't need to take revenge, or I can see where you're coming from, but nah, but no. This time, I was all on board for him taking revenge against these, especially the narcissist egoist of an actor that thought that he could do the entire play as a one-man act. And I'm... No. Just, 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 just no. But I was totally on board with Dan taking revenge in this particular instance. I was I was rooting for him, heck, even. I, I can't stand bad, bad acting for one thing, especially in live plays and renditions I, that require finesse and sophistication and come on, please do not ruin Shakespeare. I mentioned it in my reaction. I've seen Taming of the Shrew it was like a 50s or 60s rendition and I've seen a great rendition, a like a great original-ish rendition of Midsummer Night's Dream that was ph phenomenal. I mean, Taming of the Shrew was alright, I wouldn't say it was ruined, but these actors or just ruined Shakespeare, and I hate that they did that because I love Shakespeare. I really do. Again, there's still plenty of his works that I have yet to read, but I love the way he tells stories, and frankly, I love a lot of old English and like like how it's how it's presented, especially in this kind of format. It's it's so fascinating. So many fun things. And a little bit of a deviation, well, more like a little bit of a side note, uh, Chris's tongue apparently cannot work at all because he was eating soap soup, and not even joking, soap soup without any complaint. Even when he heard that it was soap soup, he still kept eating it. Maybe he's got the wrong <clears throat> But another final little interesting thing about this episode that I actually found out uh, after I rewatched it a couple of times was apparently this particular episode had a lot of drafts and the production of this particular episode had a little bit of trouble. It was a bit of a production disaster is what I've heard. Um, and I know that there's a little bit of a mixed review from the fan base is what I've also heard. I don't care what other people say. I personally liked this one because I connected with it in so many different ways, and again, it was the first time that I was absolutely rooting for Dan on this one. So it was definitely significant for me, at least. People can have the mixed reviews all they want. I personally liked this one. I wouldn't necessarily say it's my favorite, but I definitely liked it a lot. Other people may not, but people usually connect with all different kinds of episodes in very different ways. The exact same thing happens with me in South Park. Like, some of my favorite episodes, a lot of people were surprised about, or some of my favorite episodes so far, a lot of people were surprised about, but it's like, because I connect very differently with different episodes in different ways, and, like, I'm not, maybe not the typical person who would watch something like South Park or Dan Versus, so my opinion is obviously going to be vastly different from a lot of people, but regardless, I still liked this, I still loved this episode for very different reasons. But that's my opinion. Just my opinion. That is why this is a review. It is my review of this particular episode and particular aspects of this episode.
Just my opinion. That is all. But anyways, that is all that I have to say for the ye old Shakespeare Dinner Theater, which is burned to the ground now. So, I mean, I guess kind of yay. If they found better actors, maybe it could have been a decent hangout spot. I don't know. But thank you all for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed the reaction as well as the review. Did I mention that the reaction was going to be linked in the description below? I don't know. I don't remember if I have, but I guess I have already now. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And as usual, until the next video, guys, check you laters.